we'll just, we'll talk about the new homework after we finish all this recursive green function stuff because it's all based on what's in chapter four. So, um, if there are no questions of any sort, then I'm going to start going over what we did. I don't know now. It's been a while, almost two weeks ago. So we were doing, we introduced and started going through this initially the Dyson's equation, and then uh, kind of just going directly from this. And this is sort of the the foundation for the, our recursive green function algorithm that we use for um, to numerically efficiently calculate. Uh, the parts of the green function we need, like the diagonal blocks and the first block column. And it's based on partitioning up the Hamiltonian, like on the top line where you have, um, you know, something that you already know the answer to, H0, and you already know the green function for E minus H0, and then you include this extra term exactly using the equation at the bottom of the page. And we showed this as an exact solution in a number of different ways. Uh, just by, you know, direct manipulation, expanding out as a power series, summing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then there's, importantly, so that's the normal form that you see for the Dyson equation is what we first wrote down here at the bottom at the bottom of the page where you have g plus g, little g plus little g v g big g that's the normal way you see it but there's also this alternative form that we make use of the thing in parentheses there where you just re, on the right hand side in the second term you reverse the order of the big g and the little g and we show that that's also a solution an exact solution for the green function just by direct manipulation making I mean, it just makes use of the fact that inverses commute. Um, so, and these two forms we use to derive, you know, the final form of the uh, recursive green functions that we use. Um, so then we just started going through some examples. Um, and... This notation we introduced with these, you know, little triangles, superscripts. So a little triangle pointing to the left meant it's a left connected green function uh, connected exactly, taking into account exactly everything to the left of it off to negative infinity. And, you know, a little triangle pointing to the right um, is the right connected green function taking into account everything exactly off to positive infinity. So these are really surface green functions, taking into account exactly everything on some, what do you call it, um, um, semi-infinite region, either to the left or to the right. And we introduce that because when you start doing this, you have both, both types of green functions and you need to keep track of which is which, otherwise you'll go crazy. Which you may do when you start doing the homework, when you really see what's in, involved in keeping track of everything. So we introduce this, I mean, this notation where, you know, a, a little, a little, a little g all by itself is, is not connected to either the right or the left. The g with the triangles are connected either to everything to the right or to the left. And the big G is reserved for the exact green function that is the exact solution that we're looking for. And then we'll talk, we're going to, come on, there we go. We're going to talk uh, more about this today. Um, this was sort of the archetypal partitioning scheme that we use when we do device modeling. No question. No, I oh. had one question actually. Oh, you can ask now. Okay. So in the last lecture, we just uh, calculated G right connected, small G right connected, and 
simultaneously showed that G left connected was zero at that point. So do you just explain why that is here? Okay. Let me come back to that when I have a fresh white page to write on. Okay. So we'll come back to that. Um, so we're going to talk more about this sort of generic partitioning that we use. It's really powerful um, in which we treat whole regions on the left even when there's some kind of band bending as an equilibrium region. And you can move those books you know, if you want. Just give them to me if you want. Um, and, um, and same with the region on the right. Recently, um, Cairo was having trouble with uh, convergence issues modeling an FET, and when he started uh, using these boundary conditions, um, everything everything started being very nice. And usually, they just make the numerical calculation much easier. And we'll talk about that in more detail today. We call these the generalized boundary conditions. But this is the way we're partitioning. The, Partitioning, partition the device. Everything from minus infinity to zero is in equilibrium with the left uh, Fermi factor. So you have these states. Uh, they're not just plane wave states because you have some band bending, but the filling of the states is determined by that uh, chemical potential and Fermi factor of the left lead. And same on the right hand side, that region from n plus one to infinity, even though you have band bending there. And so your states are not just plane wave states. Uh, the filling of those states is considered to be just determined by the Fermi factor and the chemical potential of the right lead. And we'll talk about that more today. And also, as drawn at the bottom of the page, in those regions, which we'll also discuss more, um, you have a non-zero imaginary term that you add to the uh, um, diagonal elements of the Hamiltonian. Um, and serves two purposes when you calculate your surface green function. It helps convergence in those iterative uh, approaches. And then we'll talk about more of the purpose it serves in those regions where, where band bending is occurring. We'll talk about that more today. And then we just went through um, the nitty gritty of these recursive green function algorithms that we actually use starting by calculating uh, the surface green function on the far right and then moving it, quote, walking it across the device all the way to node uh, two, I guess. Um, and then same with the left connected uh, surface green function and moving that across to node zero, I guess. And this, so this is what I have in red. And once you have these two guys, then you can calculate the exact diagonal green function at node 1, which is the first node of your device. And these give you the two surface green functions that are um, your self-energies that take into account exactly uh, the semi-infinite regions to the right of node 1 and to the left of node 1. Um, and as we noted, if you only need the transmission, if you only need the transmission, that's all you need to do. Get G11 and you stop there, which is really nice. But if you needed the electron on hole density, then you need to keep going to get the diagonal elements of G in the first, um, first uh, block column of G. And that's what we described here, how we do that. Um, and I guess this is, you know, one of those instances where your question comes up where I'm crossing off, say, a left connected uh, surface green function down there on the bottom line. Right? I'm getting, I'm saying, uh, you got to look at what your, what the, what your perturbation potential is. And here is the T that couples J to J minus 1. So when we calculate the bare green functions, you calculate them sending that term to zero. The t is a couple of node j 
to j plus 1 as I'm sort of sketching uh, at the, in that little sketch at the very bottom of the page in red. So you have no j minus 1, you have no j, and there's no coupling between them. So I have these two semi-infinite regions like this, and there's no coupling between them. So at no j, I cannot have a left connected surface green function. There is nothing to connect to. Similarly, I can't have anything that crosses the boundary between j and j minus 1. And in no j, here's no j, I cannot have a left connected that connects to any, you know, anything to the left. Because there is no connection for the bare green functions. Right? The, the bare green functions are the exact green functions of this disconnected system that you're looking at. They are the exact green functions of this disconnected system. So the only, the bare green function sitting at, at J has to take into account everything to the right. It is by definition the right connected green function. Right? I mean that's really the key. You got to, it's best, if, when in doubt, draw your system and the little g's are the green functions of this system where you've broken some connection somewhere. And they have to be the exact green function of that system that's missing some coupling element. Those are your bare g's. So, I mean, everything on the right has got to be a right connected green function. And everything in the left half has got to be a left connected green function. Well, at least if you calculate it at these nodes here. Which are usually the ones we need. All right. And uh, what are the those terms D? Is this the site energy plus the potential? Uh, oh, D like D J. Yeah. Uh, D J is just well, yeah. I mean, if it's just a scale or it's just a site potential. I mean, what is the I mean, what value to put for a, a specific site for D? Just like epsilon plus the potential V term. Is that it? In a single band model, yeah, it would be whatever that site energy is, epsilon plus whatever potential is on that site. And if it's a D block, say, you know, SP3, then the diagonal elements would get shifted by the potential. And the rest would just be the site energies of like epsilon S, epsilon P. And you add the potential onto that due to that site. That potential should be calculated like self consistently. We'll talk about that today. Yeah. The self consistent Poisson negative loop. Yeah. Okay. Clear on what little g is, what big g is. You'll have more fun with that when you actually try to <laughs> do the homework. Okay. Um, and so we just work through the, um, you know, to get to the final uh, numerical expressions that you'd want to implement for this particular algorithm. Also noting that, you know, to generate either the block um, diagonal elements like we show in that red box down there, um, you need, when you, as you walk your right connected green function, this guy here, you Remember, that was the first thing you did. You walked him to the left across the device. Well, you also need to store, store that away for every, for every uh, diagonal block because you reuse it here and again. So you need enough memory to store those blocks away. And let's see. So finally, oh, yeah. And I think in, when we derived this, we made use of the first time the alternative form of Dyson's equation. So we started off with this equation in the box, and as usual, for the, for the full green function, we get some off-diagonal, you know, j minus 1j term, which then we need to write another Dyson equation for, and then back substitute. And so for the first time, when we wrote the other Dyson equation, we used this alternative form of Dyson's equation here.
and back substituted that to get um, something that looks similar. Now, usually our self-energy term is like a T little g T. But now because we use this alternative form of Dyson's equation, it's got this slightly different form of a T exact G T. Um, but this is, you know, this is the recursive green function algorithm we use to move the diagonal block um, starting from the 1, 1 node back across the device going to the right. You noted that all these equations are summarized like each one you'd want to implement. If you're actually implementing this algorithm and then what to do and once you've calculated the diagonal blocks um, and that first block column what to do with it all. Uh, so you need to calculate the charge in, in those band bending regions of the leads. Uh, you need what we call regions uh, one and two. And um, also in the non equilibrium region of the device. So, in the non equilibrium region, we just use the normal equation we derived before. And in the equilibrium region, in the right lead and in the left lead, we just use. Um, we just use these equilibrium expressions. You know, basically, the density of states times the Fermi function to get the uh, um, electron density or hole density in those band bending regions of the leads. All right, and that, and of course, our transmission. So that brings us up to where we were last time. Okay, so now we've come up to. We covered the whole recursive green function up this, uh, through section 4.3 of the notes. And now we're coming to sort of a detailed description of what we call these generalized boundary conditions. I think it's just best to first just look at the picture because it illustrates it so well in the notes. So this is taken from an applied physics letters that we did when we were doing the NEMO program back in 95 to illustrate these boundary conditions in a real device simulation that we actually used. And they were absolutely necessary to match the experimental data. So this was a device in um, A. That we, we had the model, and here was an, another device over here in uh, C. Um, and if we first look at, at this one, this is so in this one you have these very long regions that are lightly doped, and you have your heavily doped source, a heavily doped re, uh, drain, and then these very long regions that are lightly doped. Then you have this double barrier, uh, the resonant tunneling structure in the middle. Okay, this is your conduction band edge we're looking at. And so what we're plotting here, this grayscale plot is the, um, so this is the energy axis, this is position. Uh, this is a grayscale plot of the um, spectral function at each site and each energy. Think of it as the density states or the magnitude of the wave function squared at each site and each energy. Okay, so I'm injecting a wave, and it's going to get backscattered and set up a standing wave. Right, so you see these standing wave patterns, and the wavelength gets shorter as I move up in energy. So that's all makes sense, right? The wavelength is getting shorter as I move up in energy. And you, you know, I'm sending in this wave. Most of it's getting reflected, so it's the standing wave. And you think of your scattering state that you're sending in. In the well, I've got these two resonant states: your particle and a box state. So the fundamental one is just this, you know, this usual cosine type with a node, a node, you know, the biggest part right in the middle. The second one is the second cosine wave, which, when you take the magnitude squared, which is what we're looking at, has a node right in the center of it, right? Because it's like uh, cosine 2, um, what is it? Well, you know, the set is cosine 
particle in a box states. Um, help me out here. Sign. N pi x over L. Yes, thank you. <laughs> N pi x over L. And the second one would be 2n pi x over L, I guess. Yes. Pi x over L. Right. So, I mean, you just picture your cosine, right? The, the next one, and then the next one's odd with a null right in the center. So, when you take the magnitude squared, that's what you're seeing right here. There's a null right in the center of it, so that all makes sense. We've applied a bias, so you can see it's actually shifted a little bit to the right, and that makes sense also. So it all, even this one, you can see a slight shift to the right due to the applied bias. You can think of that as a stark shift, if you've ever heard of that. At any rate, everything seems to make sense so far. And now, if you look down here, you see these states. And these also look like particle-in-a-box states, Here's, except it's more of a triangular confining potential. You've got the fundamental state, the next state you've got two nodes, the next state you've got three nodes. So again, it's what you expect from confined states, right? For each state you get one more node as you go up in energy. Right? It's like a particle in a box state. I mean, granted, the, the, or a harmonic oscillator, right? You're spreading out, but each one is going to have another node in it. Okay, so these are the states that just come out of the uh, imaginary part of the green function that you've calculated in this structure. Now, as you look up here, this entire region up to this barrier is treated as the left reservoir. So all these states are filled according to the uh, Fermi factor of the left reservoir. Same with the right side, all these states, which aren't so critical, are assumed filled with the Fermi factor of the uh, right reservoir, which is way down here. So at this energy, all these states are just empty. So anything that's injected here is getting sent through. And nothing's coming back. And these states are called quasi-bound states here. And throughout this entire region, for the first time we're using eta for something other than a convergence factor. So eta here has to be something that is, will give you the broadening of these states um, that you would, that exist experimentally. And the broadening of these states is due to incoherent scattering processes, such as phonon scattering and electron-electron scattering. And these scattering processes are really difficult to do exactly, or even approximately. Um, so by using an eta here of, and I, I can't remember what we used, 15 millivolts, 20 millivolts, I guess I don't show the IV characteristic that we actually calculated from this. I should include that, I suppose. We were able to reproduce very, very closely the experimental IV characteristic. And this is, you know, up till now, and, and we did the same thing over here. Here it's an even more extreme case. So this whole region up to the barrier is treated as a left reservoir including all this stuff here. We assume that all these states are in equilibrium with the Fermi factor of the left reservoir. And the same on the right side, although that's not so critical. So all these states in this well here, even down to this state down here, are being filled by the Fermi factor of the left reservoir. And if you look, I, I, I don't know where the band ends, but you know, if the band stayed flat out here, this would be, at least as far as this lead is concerned, a true bound state. Granted, they can leak out way over here. And again, we used uh, a, an eta, an imaginary potential throughout this whole region of about maybe 20, 15 to 20 milli, milli electron volts. And then what this allows you to do is here you can just see the fundamental resonance between the barriers here, the next resonance there. This allows you to inject from these 
what's called quasi-bound states in your source or emitter into the and through the resonant state in the well. And these are what we call the generalized boundary conditions because for the, you know, when you think of how this algorithm works, somewhere we can see a better way out here. So way out here in the flat band region, you calculate, say using the decimation method or the dumb iterative method, the surface green function of your semi-infinite region. Right? You can only use those methods where um, the potential is not varying as a function of position. And actually we probably cheat and just assume up here is a good enough place to calculate that surface green function because the electric field is pretty pretty full, zero, much zero up here. So we calculate the surface green function up here and um, and then walk it in using our recursive green function algorithm, move the surface green function to this point. And so we have a surface green function here, and this is where you calculate your gamma that you use to calculate your transmission, right? The transmission is like, um, well, if we just take the first form, that uh, Fisher-Lee form, it's like gamma 1, 1, G1, N, gamma N, N, G, N, 1 dagger, right? So that gamma 1, 1 you calculate here, which is just, you know, T times the surface, T that couples you to the first device node, T surface green function of all this T. And so that surface green function contains all the information of this spectrum here, of this band bending, is taking into account all of this band bending exactly. Um, and it's, it shows up in the self energy you use for the quote device. And when you think of you know how we derive initially the um, self energy and the surface green function, it was when we did it from the wave function approach. It was related to the injection velocity, right? The gamma we got, which was related to the imaginary part of the sigma, which is related to the imaginary part of the surface green function came down to a velocity and the velocity divided by a gave you an injection rate but now you know if you're down below the continuum here there is no velocity associated with the state it's a bound state in terms of the surface green function here especially when you you know the surface green function is calculated setting this coupling to zero zero you have a hard wall and on this side you're below the continuum, so this is truly a bound state as far as the surface green function is concerned. The only reason it doesn't have a zero energy width, like a true bound state, is you've thrown in this imaginary potential. And so now, you know, this is something very different from, you know, just a velocity divided by A. Really, the rate is coming from the eta that you're putting in by hand to broaden broaden this state, both the energy broadening and the rate that goes into your gamma are related. And, um, you know, once you start playing these games in a device like this, then you just have to check that as you play with eta, the, you know, the current is insensitive to the value of eta you're choosing. And so, you know, we check that and it doesn't make too much difference over some range of eta's. As you let eta go to zero, you won't get any current at all coming out of this state. It becomes a true bound state with no velocity. As you make eta too large, you broaden this out so much that the current starts going down again. And so there's some sort of physically, now you have to just sort of be guided by the physics and you know from experimental work that the broadening of these states is on the order of 10 to 20 MeV and that sort of guides you in what value to choose for your eta. I'm sorry, why if I increase eta too much, why should the current go down? 
if you think of this in, ter this is in terms of your spectral function, an en uh, distribution and energy, this is a single state here. It's, and the, the spectral function in the energy axis is a Lorentzian. And it's normalized. So if I make it very broad, the peak goes down. I basically turn, smush it out into like white noise if I make eta too big. And so when this resonance aligns with this, there won't be anything special there anymore. Right now you see it when these, as, these, as this level crosses these levels, you actually see features in the IV that they were seeing experimentally. As you apply a bias, you pull this level down, it crosses these levels, and you see these features in the current voltage curve. And these we were able to reproduce with this. If you were just to use a Schrodinger's equation, and so we were, we had several, we were, had implemented several approaches and were comparing codes and methods. And, you know, we had one code that was just a straight Schrodinger solver. And so as soon as this level drop below the continuum here, the current shut off because we were just injecting plane wave states from the continuum as you would do in the Schrodinger's equation. And I still don't know today of any way to you know, do this kind of trick using a wave, a wave function approach. I only know how to do it using green functions. And for this kind of device, it's absolutely critical to do this. Um, no one, because, okay, the next thing is, you know, in reality, I mean, so let's ask in reality what's really happening, right? I mean, nature doesn't just put in an ADA. So in reality, you know, you do have a reservoir back here. This is your heavy doping region. You are injecting plane wave states up above the continuum here. They come to the barrier, they get reflected. But there's also these incoherent scattering processes, both electron, 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 phonon, that allow you to lose energy and scatter down and fill these states. And that's physically what's happening. And so as long as, you know, these scattering processes, these scattering rates, one over tau, are faster than your tunneling rate, then these states are going to be pretty well equilibrated with the scattering states that are coming in to fill them. So these scattering states are filling them as long as that's fast compared to the, the rate at which they're leaking out through the barrier. They're going to be well equilibrated with the scattering states. The filling of the scattering states is determined by the filling of where they came from, which is the left lead. So that's physically what's happening. But numerically, to actually treat that by really treating the incoherent scattering is extremely difficult and just really not worth the effort for what it buys you. It's an extremely difficult calculation because um, uh, it's, we haven't even started ta uh, talking about the, the scattering algorithms but um, yeah let me let me save that for later. Um, so this is the way it's treated and you can do the same thing for an FET and maybe I'll talk about that later when we start talking about the, the uh, Schrodinger um, or the negative uh, Poisson self-consistent calculation. These boundary conditions, once we started using them, they're really what um, made and saved the NEMO program. It allowed it, it to model these, all these different types of devices with different um, doping configurations in the source, and even and you know even very strange configurations like this, and um, even even more bizarre potential profiles in the source. Um, it's allowed given very reasonable results simply by putting an eta in here and treating it as equilibrated with your source uh, Fermi level. Okay, so those are the generalized boundary conditions and you know usually students 
don't like all the extra work and you know involved algorithmically to code them up because you know you got to define the flat band region then you got to define the region where there's band bending and it's like oh man I'll just f it I'll just treat the whole thing but at the end of the day if you don't do this problems always arise and I'll show the problems that arise when you just do a simple FET in a moment why, why they don't solve? Like whereabouts over here or where? I mean, so here you always have a heavily doped region. Generally, as I know, I don't want to derive that why they don't solve the region. Um, it's just like you can think of that as your contact region. I mean, you need to apply a bias. And if you look at what's happening, you know, the, the bands, your family level is only, you know, well equilibrated out here in the heavily dope region, and there's a lot of band bending everywhere else. So if you want, if you want a very fast device, you need to actually move your heavily dope region up here so it gets from source to drain very quickly. Now, you know, there's actually, um, it has this huge transit time just to get all the way across the lightly dope region where, the, where there's an electric field. So you just need a heavy doping region just to have a well-defined Fermi level and be able to apply your bias. And then for these particular devices, you really want to, just like in a high, high electron mobility transistor, you really want to keep your dopants away from this region because they uh, create scattering and reduce, um, actually reduce your peak to valley ratio. You want to keep this, quote, device region very clean no impurities around there, no scattering, no scattering around the quote device region. And that's also true, well, for some FET designs. Okay, so let's look at, um, that's all sort of very discursive. Let's just look at a few equations to understand what we're really doing. So in the source region, um, you know, we're treating this whole source as in equilibrium so the filling is determined by the uh, left Fermi level and we'd like to understand how good is that approximation or what do you need for that approximation to be good so uh, let's look at the expression for um, our non-equilibrium um, electron density so the non-equilibrium electron density at a given site, J, is equal to, well, as a function, just as a, at, yeah, sorry, as a function of each energy. And this would be before I do the integration over energy. 2 over 2 pi A, and I'll just write it out. So this is the, the left connected spectral function weighted by your left Fermi factor plus your right connected spectral function weighted by your uh, right Fermi factor. This is our left connected spectral function and our right connected. Right, basically the wave function squared that's being injected from the left lead and the wave function squared that's being injected from the right lead. Right, so the physical meaning of those things. And, and so these are your scattering states and they're being weighted by each respective Fermi factor. Okay, the density of states at each site times just your left plus your right, which is just, you know, the left plus the right is just a total spectral function. But I'm writing it out because we got to compare and see how good <coughs> this approximation we're making is. Okay, the electron occupation at a site J is simply the density 
divide, so this would be your non-equilibrium. This is how you would define your non-equilibrium occupation. The electron density divided by the density of states, right? That seems to be a reasonable way to define your non-equilibrium occupation, just a general definition. Your electron density divided by the density of total number of states, and that would be your occupation. Okay? Has nothing, this, has no, this is just a general definition, has nothing to do with the Fermi factor, just would be the uh, definition of the occupation, any site of any energy. And so, well, so we just write that out in terms of our density of states and our expression above. So we have our left connected spectral function times F E minus mu left plus our right connected times F of E minus mu right over just the sum of the spectral functions. And we're saying that in the left lead, um, this just reduces to the total spectral function times F left. And so what, what, you know, what, what does it take to make that a good approximation? And so in, in our structure, you know, in some kind of device that we've been looking at, where you just have some barrier region separating your left and your right, or a double barrier region, right? If I inject my, my wave from my right, most of it, a huge amount of it, you know, like 99% of it's going to get reflected. Because the transmission coefficient will be less than like 0.1 or something, 0.01. And the same on this side. If I inject from the left, most of this guy is getting reflected. Which means that over here in the left contact, or left reservoir, or whatever we want to call it over here, that I can basically ignore A right, and that over here, the total spectrum, since A right is negligible, A is just A left in the left contact. So a very good approximation to like 99%. And if that's true, then I can just get rid of these terms, and this cancels, right? And I have that the occupation in the left contact is just my equilibrium Fermi factor. It would just be the right injected wave. Say it again? That would just be for the right injected wave. Uh, I'm not sure. Which so which one do you mean by the right? Which one? The one that I call psi left or psi right here? So the, the spectral function would just be the left. Yeah, it would be A sub. So A, yeah, so yeah, what I'm saying here. So the total over here on the left side is just A sub left. Just for the left Because the way, I mean, I mean, the total one, A, is, you can think of it as like psi left squared plus, you know, the total psi right squared. But over there, psi right squared is negligible on the left side. Another just terminology that's used, and I haven't seen it for a while, we used to use it, is that this type of boundary condition um, it separates the kinetics from the dynamics. So the dynamics are determined by your Hamiltonian, H. And so we're calculating, you know, the green function exactly in those, in, in those regions. We're taking into account the band bending and all that stuff. Exactly. Granted, we're throwing in an eta, but so there's, okay, it's a small approximation because of the eta, but so that's actually related to the kinetic. So this determines what this, you know, since this determines your spectral function and it determines the actual states, your quantum states, right? Your Hamiltonian determines your quantum states, the energy levels, all that. The kinetics 
is is simply how those states are filled. And so in the leads, we're kind of pulling those two things apart, treating the dynamics more or less exactly, and just filling them approximately by the left Fermi factor. In the device, those two things are completely intertwined. The dynamics, you know, the, you have to, like you say, your resonant tunnel in your, in your quantum well, the resonant region, the dynamics determine how you, you know, tunnel into that region. And then it's kind of like the rate, determine the rate at which you tunnel in. And the rate immediately is part of the kinetics, which determines how that level, the resonant state is filled. And we showed last time in a homework assignment that um, under certain conditions, you can approximate it really well as a rate equation, where the dynamics would be your gammas that term, determine how much, well, they're all combined. The gammas are coming out of your green function and also determining the rate at which you're filling the well. So in the non-equilibrium region, these two things are combined together, the dynamics and kinetics, um, on how the non-equilibrium states are filled. But in the leads, we separate them out and just sort of fill them by hand. So I think that brings to a close chapter four. Uh, and this would be a good time actually to, now that it's all fresh in your mind, to talk about the homework problems for chapter four since they're right here. Let me put them up. Okay, so the first one It's just going to be some practice, you know, using the recursive green function algorithm. Um, so again, for number one, you're looking at our ideal chain that we've been looking at for two quarters now, right? Going back to 208. Your ideal tight binding chain. And we already, in, I guess, homework one or, or in just actually in the, in chapter one, I think, we give the exact green function for any site, right? And since it's a uniform j chain, sorry. Right, so this is our tight binding chain that we've been doing for two quarters. And since it's uniform, you know, the exact GJJ is the same everywhere, right? The exact diagonal element is no different on one site than any other site. So you already know that, and it was just, you know, there, I think it was like one of your first problems in your homework. You calculated this, like in terms of energy, velocity, and K. You calculated this every which way you could possibly calculate this diagonal green function, I think. Pretty sure. Yeah, okay. So you know this. And now the question is, use Dyson's equation to calculate G I. J. What would you do? I mean, you you know, you already know. Let's just choose one of these guys. Let me erase the other. I don't know. I haven't looked at the solution for a while, but I mean, you already know the surface green function on either side. G. What would I call it? Though? My left connected guy at j minus 1, j minus 1, and my right connected guy at j plus 1, j plus 1, right? You know those guys. Um, and this looks like the equate, what we needed to calculate a, a block column. So what would I do? Um, row, column. I guess, well, let's just try try one way or the other. So G, J comma J plus one is going to equal what? It's like usually, I mean, you know, I think what we want to look at is the algorithm we use to get that left block column. And there, there was the last equation, set of equations we developed to get that left block column in the recursive green function algorithm. Uh, the left block column. So if I start with 
I start with um, G J J plus one. So first you got to decide what you're going to perturb. So in this case, I guess we would be, you know, this would be the matrix element. This would be the matrix element J, J plus one. That would be our perturbation. And so, let me just try something. I really don't know. <laughs> so I would say that that's equal to my left connected JJ plus uh, left connected JJ TJ J plus one on my exact G J plus one comma J. No, that's not getting me any closer. This is where you yeah, really end up <laughs> playing around. <laughs> Let me look at how we calculated the left block column. Uh, so the left block column, oh, I got it. Uh, oh, let's just see, it's in the notes here. The left block column. So, okay, we had the exact diagonal blocks everywhere, and then we wanted to create this guy. So let's see. So this is equations 438 and 439 of the notes. Okay, so if I have, and, and we have the exact GJJ. Uh, so G, uh, and I have the exact G11. I can, so GJ1, so we've already done this, is, let's see. G right connected JJ. Let me see both. Okay, so I have the same. What did I do here? J minus one comma one. Oh, I see. So the first one. This is a weird way to do it. You should really look, write it like this. G. Uh, oh, I see. So I'm doing it down there. J1, J minus 1, 1. J plus 1. I mean, I think that's the answer right there. So we've, I mean, we've created, you know, so I mean, here, right, in these equations here, you know, 1 could be any J, right? 1 could stand for any J. 1 is not special. We just chose one because we needed the first block column. But I could let one be two or three or four or any j because, you know, it's a uniform chain. <laughs> any one j looks like any other j. So, but you always have to start off with, I guess, a, a diagonal element. So j1. So once I have the first block column, you know, so 1, 2 is going to look like j, j plus 1, j, j plus 2, j, j plus n, right? These only depend for a uniform chain on, on the difference between the two, between the two, uh, between the two guys. So yeah, I would take a look hard, this is, take a hard look at, at what we did here to get these. I mean, here we're creating the off diagonal, the off block diagonal ones, right? And in this simple model, these guys are just like, right, e to the i, k, a over t. And you had them in terms of energy and k and velocity and all that good stuff. Those are just your surface green functions. Okay, so that's what you're going to do in problem one. What's problem two? Uh, where did it go? Oh, here it is. Um, problem one, problem two. Oh yeah, so this is allowing you to apply this generalized boundary condition in a very, very simple model. 
number two, and actually see what happens when you're injecting from a quasi-bound state in the emitter. And for you, this quasi-bound state is just going to be a single node. So I say, take the model structure in figure 2.6. So figure 2.6 was, I believe, this, you know, we had this ideal lead and then this resonant level and another ideal lead here. This was figure 2.6. And now I'm saying, okay, we're going to treat the left lead like that. Sorry. I wonder why you're all looking so... Okay, so let me do that again. So figure 2.6 was this structure you did and, went, you know, you had a resonant level. And now I'm saying your left lead is going to become this, a single site. It's like having a single quasi-bound state for your left contact. You can make it twice. No, no you can't. What's that? I mean, the first two is a device and no. then there's an electron. No, this is my left, sorry, where is it? This is my left contact, because this is, this is an exercise in those generalized boundary conditions. Here's my device, and here's my right lead, or right contact. And over here, you're going to put an I eta on this site. Let's see, this work minus epsilon plus I eta. All right, so this your surface green function becomes one over E minus epsilon plus I eta. That is your your surface green function for this lead. And I think to actually, you know, do the an calculation analytically, you just assume it's a w the wide band limit over the r on the, on the right side. So you have some on the right hand side uh, in the wide band limit. What do we usually have? It's like um, e. Uh, I think it's minus i gamma whatever la uh, right over two. I think, let me, let's look at the problem. And you, let's look at what we got here. So we treat the right lead in the wide band limit, all right, and approximate sigma r like what I just wrote down. With gamma r, I give you a value to use for gamma r of 1 MeV. We let, I give you values for the coupling, so this is the coupling from here to here, and here to here. And I guess they're the same, right? 10 MeV. Sorry. So these couplings, these couplings here from the lead to the device. Actually, I don't think you need this one over here because you're already given gamma. But you need this one on the left for T left because your, your sigma on the left side is the usual, you know, T left, G zero zero, T left, which is now just going to be T left squared over this E minus epsilon plus I eta. Right, that's the self energy for your left, quote, contact. And let's see, so what am I saying about epsilon? So I'm, I'm also, you're going to let all these epsilons and epsilon R just be zero. So actually, the surface green function is just this, E plus I eta inverse, because epsilon is zero. Um, and then I say derive an expression for the current as a function of eta. And then for three different values of eta, given 0 0.1, 1, and 10 MeV, plot the transmission from minus 20 to 20 MeV. See what you get. And this is exactly what happens in those big numerical problems we were looking at. You're going to get, when you plot this transmission, you're going to get some, um, you know, I think one of them you're going to get, actually get, you know, a double peak. And that's coming about because you've got, you know, this, depending on, on the ADA you use, you've got 
website. Depending on the ADA you use, you've got this energy level in your lead, and your ADA is determining the width, the energy width of that level. And then you've got the energy level in your of your quote, you know, your device, right? And because we've already set gamma, what did we choose gamma to be? Gamma R. Gamma R was, what was that chosen to be? Um, 1 MeV. So gamma R is 1 MeV. Uh, gamma R. So that means that this, this guy is always going to be have a full width of half maximum of at least gamma R. Too many windows. Okay. Uh, where did it go? Which window did I want? No. Uh, hello. There we go. So this this guy, my my you know energy resonance of a quote device, has a minimum width of at least gamma R, of one MeV. Because remember the the width of your your level is gamma R plus gamma L. So this sets a minimum on on the energy width of that resonant level of your quote device. Right, the full width half maximum was gamma left plus gamma right. And so as we ch as we play with eta on the left side, that's going to affect gamma left. But you know gamma right always gives you a minimum for the broadening of the level in the device. And we're changing the, the, the width of eta from like 0.1 millivolts, which is 10 times less, less than gamma, to like 10 millivolts, 10 times more. And so you're going to see what happens. I think you get this, this feature over on the right, you know, when, when this level is skinny compared to this level and basically kind of cuts it in two. Because what you're seeing then is this effect. If you have two levels that are coupled like that, Two quantum levels that are coupled, what happens? Like the first problem you did in 208. So they, they, if they're coupled, then they become two levels like that. And now you give them some broadening, and the transmission ends up looking like that. A double peak. And that's what you see. That's what you'll see. And then when one level becomes really fat, then you'll just see a single peak. I mean, when this becomes like, you know, really fat, you were asking about, you know, what happens, it, then you just are basically integrating over the whole device level and you really don't see the feature of, of the level in the emitter. And then you just see a single resonant peak. And this is exactly the thing. If you do it all numerically, you also see this. And as you play, just by playing with ADA, I'm just confused. Why the two peaks? Uh, where are the two levels coming from? My device is in the one level, right? And your contact, your lead, is the other level. Here are your two levels, right there. Right, that's a discrete level in your left quote contact. Just like you know those pictures of the spectral functions. Those were discrete levels in the left contact. And this contains, you know, all the qualitative figures that those big numerical in terms of understanding the effect of beta and injecting from a quote quasi bound state in your co your uh, contact this turns out to be very powerful because in, in many many problems you have you've got some reasonably large barrier that separates these two systems these two states and so to a very good approximation you know this state is filled by the fermi factor of your left lead it's allowed many calculations to be done that there was really no other way to do them. Okay. This is where you see the true power of the green functions because there's just no way to do this with wave functions that I know of. No possible way that I'm aware of. If you come up with a way, let me know. 
Um, and let's see the last problem, and then we can take a break. Um, so what is the last problem? Ooh, this is a long guy. Wow. But it's a very interesting one. This is a, I really like this one. That's why it's so long. Okay, so let's see. Start uh, attaching. Okay, so again, we're starting with an ideal, our favorite ideal chain. You know, I'm going back to like your second homework of 208. Your ideal chain that we know and love by now. Everything is uniform. I guess your ideal periodic chain. Sorry. Okay, your ideal periodic chain. Let me try to get both of these. And, and then we want to attach a site to this node here. And then we want to calculate the transmission the transmission through my quote device where your device is now this central region okay so let's look at the problem here so we attach a node R vertically to site 1 site energy is epsilon R coupling is TR we have this infinite chain where all these epsilons are zero in the ch in our in our chain and then uh, I say starting with the exact, so this is node 1 right here, with the exact G11 of the infinite chain, calculate the exact G11 of this new structure, the Dyson's equation. So, of course, um, what you're going to be perturbing on is this, you know, this new coupling element, right? And like the bare green function you know, of this guy, what we call G bare RR would just be 1 over E minus epsilon R. You don't need to worry about the I eta if you end up manipulating it all and it all comes out okay. And this, you know, this, and now, again, it's the, you know, the system is now this entire chain, I mean, the bare, the quote, bare system is this entire chain plus this isolate, isolated state with no coupling between them. That's your, quote, bare system, right? Just to keep in mind when you want to remember what the bare green functions are. So the bare green function here is, you know, this bare green function is the exact green function of your, set, of your infinite chain from homework one. That quote, bare green function is the exact green function of your infinite chain. And now I'm saying get the exact, we want the exact G11, which now includes the effect of this, this new thing we've attached to site one. And now, that's all good. So you're going to use the recursive green function algorithm to get that. You can also, I mean, if, you know, you can, as a sanity check, you can also, you know, write out what the, if my, my device is and now a two by two matrix, so how would I label this? I'll call this site one and site R, right? That'll be my numbering system for the two by two, sorry. For the two by two matrix, it is my quote device in between the leads. There's two two sites there, okay, and so this would be you know the one one would be e minus I'll write epsilon even though it's zero minus sigma left minus sigma right. Due to coupling, you know, due to coupling to the left and right, right. Uh, then it couples. This is this would be TR. It couples to the R state, couples to the R state, and this is just E minus epsilon R. That would be the two by two that I would then need to invert 
to get, this will give me both G11, GRR, and GR1. This will give me the whole thing. So you can check your answer by, this is just a two by two matrix. You can check your answer by doing it this way. But I want to see you do it using the recursive green function algorithm where you really don't need to invert the full two by two matrix because you don't need to know what GRR is or GR1 or G1R. All you need is G11 because the transmission, if you think about transmission, is gamma, right? It only couples to site one. And both, both gamma left and, so this is gamma left, only couple to site one. Gamma right, one, one, G, one, one. Well, it's a scalar, right? So my trans, I only need G, one, one to get my transmission since that's the only, G, one, one is the only thing that couples to the leads. Your gammas are going to be the same. So that's just, you know, gamma uh, squared G11 squared. <laughs> Did I say use a wide band approximate? Oh no, uh, you can do this exactly. Oh no, what are we? Let's see, starting in the middle of the Calculate the exact G11 of this new structure. Okay. Oh, I guess using the wide band approximation, blah, 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 um, and letting this be true. Uh, to order tr squared, determine the zeros. And, okay, so here you have to do this to do something analytical, otherwise it's too nasty. So you use a wideband expression, um, determine the zeros and poles of this G1 wannabe. And to do that, you're going to have to um, use this expansion of the square root. Is you're going to have tr you know, like tr squared is your small parameter. It'll be some ratio of tr squared and your gamma, which will be small. And then sketch these uh, zeros and poles in the complex plane. So they'll have a real part and an imaginary part. And what you're going to see is this sort of in terms of making sense. You know what I don't want to see is just you know, some massive, non-understandable equation <laughs> that would be spit out of, say, uh, Mathematica. I mean, what you're going to see is you're going to see two poles. And one, one, the zero is going to be obvious. It's just going to be whatever makes the numerator zero. Okay. You're going to have something like a numerator over a denominator, whatever makes the numerator zero, and that's going to be the easy one. For your poles, you're going to have two of them. And one is going to be very close to, um, I mean, epsilon is zero, but just let me write it out. You know, your epsilon that you would get just for your ideal chain, um, and I guess the energy has to be in the lower half plane, I guess minus i, probably gamma over two or something like this. And this is this is the normal pole you get just from the infinite chain. And and these values will be, you know, slightly shifted by this by this something a ratio related to this small, small term here. They're gonna be slightly shifted, but more or less what you started with. Okay. And then you're gonna see a pole I'm just writing, I don't know which one is greater or less. That's basically this with a slight shift. So I'll just put a, a wiggle over these. Slightly shifted due to its coupling. And then, actually for the first time, the sign has changed. Plus i gamma over 2 times this small parameter. So it's, it's, it's mostly, um, you know, the pole of that isolated state slightly shifted in the, on the real axis. And the broadening is actually very, very small because it's your gamma over 2 multiplied by this small parameter. 
So you've in, it gives it a little bit of broadening and a real shift. And I can tell you that the zero, so these are the poles, and the zero is just going to be epsilon r. So when the energy, sorry, when the energy is epsilon r, that's when your transmission is exactly zero. And then you have a pole. This is just a small shift. You have a pole here that's just slightly shifted away from the zero. So you have a pole and a zero very close to each other. Now, for you EEs, I don't know if you remember your amplifier theory. <laughs> what happens when you have a pole and a zero close to each other in the transfer function? What's that? They cancel They tend to cancel each other. And what you're going to see, and, and in physics, this gives rise to what's called a Fano resonance. And this is a classic problem of a localized state weakly coupled to the continuum. And the continuum, in this case, is the band of states of that uh, chain. It's a localized state weakly coupled to this continuum band of states of the chain. And the way we set it up is that you know, epsilon r lies within the band of states. So this is your band of states. And epsilon r lies within the band itself. And this is exactly the kind of thing that happens in, in you know, band structure theory where you ha may have an impurity state within the band of states. Or you may have the highly localized d orbitals within your s band. Maybe they're close by. But this is the kind of thing that you run into in band structure theory. Okay, this could be an impurity state within your band. Purity levels within the band of states of the chain. It's a localized state, weakly coupled, and this gives rise to the Fano resonance. So I can't remember which is which comes first, is zero or the pole. So if you plot, you should. If I set this problem up right, so we've got T and E. If you plot your transmission, let's say the pole comes first, you should get something that you know your pole. And then immediately your zero, shoot, and then something, I don't know, something happens. But you get that pole and zero right next to each other. And this is a classic shape of Fano resonance. Who first, first did this, he was looking at optical. In the paper by Ugo Fano in the 50s, he was looking at optical resonances, but it's all the same mathematics. So you already know the answer to question C. Is it E equals ER? That's where your zero is. Okay, and so finally I say use in this one use the exact expression for the lead self energies. And you have all these from homework one. Okay, so we did the ideal chain. You have all these expressions in terms of energy. Probably you want them in terms of energy because you have to do this in terms of energy. And then um, go ahead and just numerically evaluate and plot this transmission for E in this range of plus or minus 0.2 EV around uh, that epsilon sub R. And uh, repeat when epsilon, oh, so let's see, where is epsilon R in this case? Oh, epsilon r is negative one EV. So the so I'm setting for the ideal chain epsilon is zero. So the bandwidth of the chain is centered at zero. That's mid band, and T is minus one EV. So the bandwidth is four T. So I'm set, I'm putting this level you know one EV above the bottom of the band. That's the alignment for the first. So it's one EV above the bottom of the band and one EV below the middle of the band. So it's a quarter way up the band. And then I'm saying, and then in the last one, just repeat where you put this level right at the middle of your tight binding band. And just see how it affects the transmission.
Okay, so what's today? Friday. We'll have another lecture Monday. We'll discuss it next Friday. And then, what, we got Memorial Day weekend after that? Uh, where are we? Oh, the end. tournament, right? Uh, oh, there it is. So, right, we'll have our normal lecture this coming Monday. We'll have another discussion section. And then, how many more lectures do we have? When's finals week? Does anyone know? Is it the 8th? I see. So we've got this lecture. Two more lectures, it looks like. When do they do the prelims? Okay. Okay, so we'll have this lecture. We'll have our discussions in this lecture. And so... I don't know, there's a lot of stuff in this homework, so I mean, I guess it won't be due until you know, fire, whenever. <laughs> Let me know how you're doing. <laughs> okay, no definite. I don't know if there will be another homework after this, so no big art. Or one very simple one. It should be easy, readily apparent. Okay, so let's take a break. And uh, well, and then finish up the last hour.